this evening, as we continue our study in the book of Genesis, we're going to complete Genesis chapter 35. We see that Yaakov, that is Jacob, and his family and others who are traveling with him are returning to the land of Israel. And the concept I want you to think about is new beginnings. Oftentimes, a new beginning comes because of some change in your life, a transition, for example. And certainly this is the case in this section of Scripture. There is a transition from returning out of exile. Now, in this case, we were told last week twice that the motivation for Yaakov going into exile, that is departing from the land of Israel, is because of a death threat from his brother. But now that relationship, at least between these two men, but there's a spiritual foundation being set. So even though in this time, there seems to be a healing between Asaph and Yaakov, Jacob and Esau, we see that the actual relationship spiritually has not been healed. And what do I mean by that? Asaph has not come to surrender to the things of God. He is not an obedient servant of God. And therefore, prophetically, the people that will come from him, and I'm speaking about the concept Edom, they will be eternally against the purpose, the will, what God is working to achieve through his people, through a covenant people. Well, look with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 35, and in a few minutes, we're going to begin where we left off last week in verse 16. But I want you to realize something. It is very significant that when we talk about the formation of the covenant people of God, I'm speaking about B'nai Yaakov, the children of Israel. They came into being in exile, meaning this. There was no children of Israel that formulated in the land of Israel, but in exile. Likewise, when we talk about the people who were going to enter into the land, having the Torah with a mandate to serve God and to be his chosen people and bring forth the will of God once more. These people were, were brought about, they were formulated where? In Egypt, meaning in exile. So for whatever reason, we find that oftentimes the people of God and the things of God they begin to be formulated. They have their origin in exile. And that shouldn't surprise us. Because when we look at the world, we see the world was in a form of exile, spiritual exile. When God created the world, he didn't create it. Tov me'od, very good. It was not in a pleasing state. It was not reflecting his order. But as I've said many times, when we look at creation, going back to Genesis chapter 1, the world was in tohu, vevohu, that is a spiritual and also a physical chaos. And it was only by means of the Spirit of God that this brought about a change that was pleasing to God. And I think that has a message for you and me. We're born into this world in sin. And therefore, we cannot reflect the purposes of God. We are not instruments that God can use. We're broken. We are corrupted by that sinful condition. But God brings us out of that through his gospel message. And we're going to see some of that very same principles being taught to us in this passage. So let's begin Genesis 35 and verse 16. We read here, and they traveled, and this is the group of people Yaakov's family and those who are traveling with him that we spoke about last week. Notice it says, and they traveled from Bet-El, the house of God. And this is important because what does Bet-El bring into our study? Worship. So foundationally, 
If we're going to experience change, if there's going to be transformation, if we're going to have a godly new beginning, it begins with worship. A desire to worship God, to be brought to a place whereby we can worship God. So they traveled from this place, Bethel, and while they were still some distance, distance of land away, it says they were coming to Ephrata. So they were still some distance away, a measurement of land is maybe how it's literally translated, to come to Ephrata. Now, Ephrata, we know we're going to be told in the text, so we don't have to, to imagine this or trust someone's opinion. The Bible's going to tell us that there's a close relationship between Ephrata and Beth Lechem. Beth Lechem, Bethlehem. Now, we can't think of that term, Beth Lechem, without thinking about the birth of Messiah. So there's an origin here once more, an origin that is going to be foundational for God's redemption. And redemption gives us the power to make that transition. It puts us in a location or a condition where a new beginning, a godly new beginning can be experienced by you and me. So they come to Ephrata. And that word Ephrata, it is originating from a word that has to do with fruitfulness. So we see something. We see worship brings us into fruitfulness. But, but something unexpected happens. We look here and they're near and we find in the second part of, of verse 16. And Rachel, she was giving birth. And in her birth, it became difficult. So it became hard in her birth, verse 17. And as it became difficult in her birth, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, because also this one to you is a son. Now, son is important because it represents an heir. It rep represents a continuation of the father's purpose. Now, there's another message within this text. We have to look at the clues, what we can knowingly assert from the text. And we begin with Bethel, worship, Ephrata, fruitfulness, and now a son is being born. And this sonship has to do with the things, the purposes of God being continued. So worship is foundational. It gives us potential to be fruitful. And fruitfulness is found in a continuation of the Father's plan, the Father's work, the Father's objective. So all of this is being given to us in the text. Look at verse 18. And it came about when her soul was going forth. Now, Rachel is in the process of dying during this, this childbirth. One of the things that some scholars have said, oftentimes new beginnings involve a death. Something dies in order to form this new beginning. So she's dying, but from her womb is coming life. And it's very important what we find being said in the text about this. So Rachel, it says, and it came about when her soul was going forth, for she is dying. She called his name, the name of this son, Ben-Oni. Now, the word on, Aleph, Vav, Nun, Nun, Sofit. It's very important that this word is a rich word in meeting. It has significant theological implications. And we find only in Hebrew can these two things be, be offered up, be brought into the text, be offered up for our consideration in one word. 
Because if you look, as I have done, as a lexicon, at a lexicon, this word own will find a couple different uh, translations. What does it mean? Own can mean strength or power. Or it can mean grief and sorrow. So in one sense, what Rachel is telling her midwife by calling her son Ben Oni is that this is the son and son can mean the outcome. If we say uh, uh, Ben Mavid, meaning a son of death, meaning death. Death is the outcome. So she is speaking about here in this birth is coming about her sorrow, her grief because she's dying. But also we have that word power or, or strength also coming from the text. So we have sorrow and grief and power and, and strength. Now, these two things seem kind of uh, uh, counterintuitive because if someone is dying, certainly they experience grief and sorrow. But why we would have this concept of strength and power place in it and here's the key when something dies it can give rise it can be a release for strength and power so she's dying but what's coming from her death that son is going to have an important part in the children of Israel look again at the text we find she calls her son or his name calls his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Ben-Yamin. And Ben-Yamin has to do with the son of my right, and right in this sense can also be a synonym for integrity. So what do we find? We find that strength and power is found in integrity. Now, this word integrity to the right, Yamin, well, what we find as well is a very important message. And that is integrity gives us strength. Integrity gives us power. But also when we are living in integrity, it is going to bring about grief and sorrow. Why is that? Because when we live in integrity and there's a connection between integrity and the will of God the attributes of God when we live in that way we're going to what be rejected by much of the world we are going to find when we stand for integrity people are going to reject us they're going to as as an English expression our integrity is going to make ourselves death dead to many people they don't want to associate with people who base their lives upon the principles the truth of god and there's many issues today social issues where the word of god says one thing but political correctness says something other and when we stand for god's integrity what's the outcome well people will reject they will deny they will say we're not going to offer you that job we're not going to have you participate with us and you'll be rejected. So we see that in this passage of scripture. Keep reading. It says, she called his name Ben-Oni, but he called him Ben-Yamin. Verse 19. And Rachel died and she was buried on the way of Ephrata. So now Rachel is no more. She has been put to death. But there's a heritage that is needed to be remembered. Now this is prophetic because if you look prophetically in the book, I believe, of, of Jeremiah, we see something. In Jeremiah, we find that this death of Rachel this morning will she speaks prophetically there. And what is taught to us is that it looks forward to a time of 
exile the Babylonian captivity. And also in that captivity, many Israelis or, or Israelites, those of Judea, were put to death as they went forth from this, this highway. You see, this place was on the crossroads. Remember, it says the way or the road of Ephrata, Derech. So this place is prophetic to us because it represents where the children of Israel, namely Judah, went into Babylonian captivity, a sorrow. But they went there for a purpose, and that is to experience redemption. So always when God has his people go into exile, it's for the purpose of bringing them, humbling them, putting them in a position where they trust him, are made to follow him, made to look to him with faith because they have no one else to trust in. And it's that desperation that leads to a right trust of God so that God can lift them up and bring them back. So we see this same principle here in what's going to happen. Why do I say that? Well, look again at verse 19. She dies, that is Rachel dies, and she's buried on this way to Ephrata. And then the text reveals something. This is, and I mentioned it earlier, this is Beth Lechem. So we see something here. We see Bethlehem being brought into the equation. And Bethlehem, what comes to our mind? Well, it is the household of David and also the birthplace of Messiah Yeshua. So with this death, we see a foreshadowing of, of two great individuals, King David and the son of David, Messiah, the very Son of God, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So this new beginning that is foreshadowed here ultimately is fulfilled in the new beginning that Messiah Yeshua can give to you. Now, why should we think about Messiah? Well, look what is done in verse 20. And Yaakov, he, he put up a monument over the, the tomb, her tomb. It is the monument of the burial, burying of Rachel even until this day. Now, this is important because the word that's used here for monument. We pay very attention. There's a play on words because a word to cause to stand, as it says here, Yaakov stood up a monument. The word for standing up and the word for monument comes from the same Hebrew root. And the word here is matseva. And matseva, well, very important. It is also found in Parashat Vayetze in the book of Genesis chapter 28. When earlier, when Yaakov was going out of the land of Israel towards Haran, what do we know? Well, there he had that dream. He had put rocks under his head and in the morning when he realized the significance of that dream, what dream was that? Well, that was the dream that the children, his children, the children of Israel were going to burst forth. They were going to spread to the north and to the south, to the east and the west throughout the land. And this is very important. It was a prophecy of the children of Israel inhabiting all the promised land and in that he also set up a monument which was related to that dream that he had the source of that dream he put his head upon that rock he anointed that rock and there's a messianic implication in the same way that we see Bethlehem Bethlehem mentioned and also going back to that same word found in Genesis 28. So he set up, that is Yaakov set up a monument over the burial place of her bearing or over her tomb. And it is the monument of the bearing of Rachel or Rachel even to this day. Verse 21. And Israel, notice the change. 
We've been talking Yaakov, Yaakov, and then in a very surprising manner, he's called Israel. Israel, noticing that change, that transition, that transformation. And this is what this passage represents for the people of God, for B'nai Israel, for the children of Israel. So Israel traveled and he pitched his tent further to Migdal Adar. And this is the tower of the herd. Tower can be for protection or tower can be a source of revelation seeing something. And the word Eder, heard, may be a reference to the children of Israel. So we're talking about Bethlehem. We're talking about this monument that represents in some ways a thinking of Messiah. That Messiah is going to die and rise again. Notice Rachel died, but there was brought up, stood up, a resurrection picture of this monument over her tomb. So notice Israel traveled and he pitched his tent further to Migdal Eder, verse 22. And it came about when Israel dwelt in that land. And here it is, not just in the land, but in that land, the land of Canaan, the land of inherit, inheritance, the land of promise. We read here that Reuben went and he laid with Bilhah, the concubine of his father, and Israel heard. Now, what do we know about this? Well, it was a sinful act. And Reuben, he represents sin among the children of Israel. And that sinfulness is going to cost him. We learn elsewhere in the scripture that because of that, he lost that right of the firstborn. And we find that that right of the firstborn skipped over him and it went to the sons of Joseph. Who was the mother of Joseph? Rachel. So we see how Rachel is being emphasized in this passage. It skipped over that age, that generation, the generation of Reuben, and it went to the next generation. And I've said many times how important that concept of the next generation is the next generation is a kingdom generation that's prophetically what we're told so all of this is foreshadowing that God is bringing the people back and he's revealing to us principles of that kingdom verse 23 the sons of Yaakov going back to not a future but in present day and the sons of Yaakov were 12. Number 12 represents the people of God. So the sons of Yaakov, B'nai Yaakov, were 12. The sons of Leah, the firstborn of Yaakov, Reuven, and Shimon, and Levi, and Yehuda, and Yisachar, and Zevulun. Verse 24. The sons of Rachel, Yosef, and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, the maidservant of Rachel, Dan, Ve, Naft, and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, the maidservant of Leah, God, and Asher. These are the sons of Yaakov, which were born to him in Padan Aram. What is that to tell us? In exile. Very important that we see this. Now, if we pay close attention, we know something. One of those sons, Benjamin, was born in Ephrata. That's not in Padan Aram. And we see something here. We see that when they come into the land of Israel, the first thing that they experience is death. What does that show? Death synonymous with sin. And what we can derive from that is the children of Israel are coming into the land, but they are not going to produce faithfulness. They are not going to bring about the will of God, but 
What is going to characterize this first coming into the land? Sin, transgression. And therefore, it, it foreshadows, as Moses taught, it foreshadows another going forth from the land, exile before that kingdom has a potential of coming. Move on now to verse 27. And Yaakov, and think of this reunion, Yaakov came to Yitzchak, his father, at Mamre, Kiryat Arba. Mamre is the word for a plain. So the plains of Kiryat Arba. And we've learned that Kiryat Arba is just another word for, another word for Hebron. And that's why it says, it is Hebron, which dwelt there, Avraham and Yitzchak. So they're coming back to Hebron. And here's the message. Hebron is unity. God is teaching that his people can only be unified in the land. That's why he's bringing them there. Not in exile, but only in the land. And we see something else. Look carefully at this scripture. When we look at it, it says that Avram and Yitzchak dwelt there. Well, the patriarchs, what should come into our mind? Promise. And there's an only ability to receive that promise is when we're unified together as one people. Verse 28. And the days of Yitzchak were 180 years. Now, 18, 180, 1800, 18,000, all of that signifies life. The number 18, when we write it, it spells chai, life. Yud chet, the other order, obviously, for life is chet yud, chai. And the point is, God is bringing them back in order that they would be a people that would impart life. That's their message. That's what Israel is about, demonstrating, teaching, and imparting life to others. But in doing so, what do we find? Once more, death. And Yitzchak, he expired and died, and he was gathered to his people, old, zaken, and elder, usva yamin, satisfied in days, or at a ripe age is another way that we could say it. And they buried him, who's that? Esav and Yaakov, his sons. Now, it's important because we have here Esav and Yaakov working together. It shows unity. It shows what God desires. What is foundational for this 180, this life to be brought about? But unfortunately, even though this is God's desire, within this text, we see many things that foreshadow that that's not going to come about in the short term. But what's going to happen? Exile. The Babylonian captivity and also the Roman exile. Now, it's significant that the Roman exile occurred after the birth of Messiah. So during this birth of Messiah, those times and Messiah's earthly ministry, there was great potential. But prophetically, we know that Messiah is going to be rejected and this rejected rejection is going to put them into their final exile for God once more to make a greater people. And here's an important message. Every time the children of Israel go into exile, they come out a greater, a more numerous, a larger people with a greater potential. And we see many indicators that Israel, it had reached a large stature when it went into this exile, this last exile. And notice this last exile, well, it's happened for almost 2,000 years. The longer the exile, the greater the outcome of its redemption will be. And this time, well, the end of the exile, it is going to bring about the kingdom in its fullness. So many important principles that we see in chapter 35. 
I'm going to end at this time. We're going to have a short lesson next week when we deal with the, the heritage, the genealogy of Asaph. But there are a few important points in that 36th chapter that we're going to lift up out of the text as we see what God has in store for those who love him and to those who reject him. Shalom from Israel.